CINE, the Council on International Non-Theatrical Events, has awarded this film a Golden Eagle in token of its excellence and has selected it to represent the United States of America in international motion picture events abroad. There's a bird up there flapping its wings. No, that's a cat. Dynamite chasing the cat. <laughs> Geese? There's another one. There's another over there. We have a cat. Which had a litter of kittens and... Three chickens and a rooster. so that you know how we think and where we're coming from and why we think we should be here. If you know all those things, you'll be able to use us better. You'll know better how to, you know, what to ask, what's in our minds, and maybe why we say certain things during the course so that you can discount those things if you choose to, in case you don't uh, agree with all the things we're going to talk about today. Well, in our first lecture at the Institute, we talk a great deal about short and long-range perspectives and how Basically, decisions made now affect our lives in the future. If you design your house to be heated with oil today, that's an easy decision, which will greatly preclude your comfort 20 years from now. We unlock something in people. The Shelter Institute, of course, is not just talking about building a house. It's talking about discovering yourself. It's not something we set out to do. It just seems to be a, a, a result of creating your own house. Had been a part of our education. One thing that happens at the office is people call and say, I love your ideas, I like the end product, I like the, the cost is so nice and low, but I don't have time to build a house. I only get two weeks vacation a year. And it's such an overwhelmingly new thought to them when I say something radical like, you know what you should do? You should take three months off next summer and build your house. It would be the best thing that could happen to you. Life is so short. You should try to get as many experiences into life. You only have one of them. Try, try to build your house. Why not? I mean, it's such a beautiful thing to do with your time. And it costs so much less to build it that that three months that you could take off are easily recouped as far as income goes. That one really looks like a house now. Once upon a time, this plant was growing. And it rained to make it grow better and then it sunned on it. <laughs> Sun shined on it. Mm. And it and it growed. Nibbly nibbly. Just like a mouse. Who's nibbling on my house? Mostly people are surprised about how inexpensive these houses are. Our house is a thousand square feet of living space, that's the size of the average American home, and it cost $4,800. That included a quarter mile of driveway and a dug well. It doesn't include labor because Patsy and I built it ourselves. The house is really very small in its overall outside dimensions, but it feels much larger. All of the glass on the south wall and the open space between the two lofts make it feel very spacious and yet it's still easy to heat. Conventional houses have all horizontal and vertical lines, but by adding diagonal lines, you can extend the horizons. 
This house is all local materials. It springs from the area and it's heated by the sun and wood, which are right here. We have one wood stove which heats the whole house because it's placed to take advantage of natural convection currents. The warm air rises up to the bedroom where it's then cooled and it falls back down to the stove to be heated. These houses are much closer to reality than conventional houses. We feel a part of the weather. As it gets colder, we stoke our stoves. It's not automatic. Uh, the seasons are a much closer part of our lives. The windows are placed to let in the winter sun, which is lower, and warms us and brightens our day. The summer sun is excluded to keep us cool in the heat of the day. We left all the trees in our sight, except two of which were in the middle of the kitchen. Those were hand-hewn to make beams to support the lofts. It's nice to bring some of the trees inside and to leave others undisturbed outside. We waited till our first winter to selectively cut some branches to let the sun into our living area without clearing the land. The houses being built are all tending to leave the site as it was before they came. You're surprised when you find a house that doesn't dominate the site, but one that blends in and appears to belong. We don't fight the natural events, but we learn more about them and use them to our advantage. In the winter, the sun can warm, and in the summer, the winds can cool. And our house is right in the trees and under them. It's protected from winter winds and from the summer sun. What an absurdity to first bulldoze everything that grows naturally, then call in an expert to plant shrubs and trees and wait for them to grow and look natural. Leave what is already there. It's often what is most suited to the site. We found that leaving the natural vegetation didn't interfere with the building process and it gave us soil protection and weather protection. We were able to dig all our foundation holes without any interference. Continuing to uh, understand the natural events, we can study the paths of the sun and predict where it will be at any time of any day of the year. And we can build our house to invite the winter sun in and to exclude the summer sun. We can draw on paper just how much sun to let in for light and for heating, and we can build to suit our needs. The roof angle and the overhang have been designed to prevent any direct sunlight from coming into the house in the summer. There are three types of heat from the sky. One is direct sunlight, which we've taken care of with the overhang. And another is diffuse sunlight from the sky, which is prevented somewhat by being under a canopy of trees. The third source of heat is glare reflected up from the ground, and that is taken care of by looking at the woods, which are dark. So we have really cut down dramatically the three sources of heat in the summer. Concerning the wind, we want the wind for a cooling ventilation breeze in the summer, and not at all in the winter. We can't really have both. It can be done somewhat by channeling toward the prevailing wind in the summer, but you can't completely accept it in one season and completely reject it in another. In the winter, you want the sun as much as possible. The angle of the overhang and the height of the windows are figured so that in the coldest part of the winter, all of the windows are illuminated by sunlight. There are days when we don't have any other source of heat in the house. Even though it's zero degrees outside, the sun is the only source of heat. And as far as the wind goes in winter, you really want to block that wind because it will remove tremendous amounts of heat from the house through infiltration. And we take care of that mostly by making sure that there are pine trees and other evergreen trees planted on the north side of the house so that they will block the wind. In the olden days, people used to build and orient their houses towards the weather. You'd have the house facing the south and you'd have the north wall be all closets to insulate you. Nowadays, you drive down a road and all the houses are oriented towards the road. It doesn't matter that that's the north and their windows and doors all open on the north. What we're trying to do is get people to think in terms of their environment, their site, again. The average house loses between one-third and one-half of its heat by infiltration. That is a physical replacement of the air coming in through doors and windows and right on through the house. There's absolutely no reason for that loss. If you build a house using plywood, polyethylene vapor barriers, build your own windows so that a minimum number are openable, then the house can become so tight that the air exchange might only be complete in, say, a couple of hours instead of a typically 10 or 15 minutes. The dramatic savings in fuel is due to the fact that we have nearly zero infiltration. Affecting greatly this condition of minimal infiltration is the way in which the windows are built. The difference between a window and a wall is that you're further asking the window to admit light. So you can see without stumbling. It allows you to see outside. And this gives us another primary function in the form of heat. The window is going to be a primary source of heat. The secondary function, which is, I believe, overdeveloped in the window, is to admit air. 
Admitting air is much better done by a screen door or a small section of window or a vent. Just because you have a window doesn't mean it has to open. In fact, that's one of the major sources of infiltration. The other thing about windows is that you don't need to buy them. They may seem quite complicated and something you might not want to build. But if you eliminate the function of opening, they're actually quite simple. These windows are framed directly to the house frame. There is no window frame as such. It is the house frame. The glass goes in. Are you tired of clicking through the commercials? Watch Commercial Free on Patreon. The link is below this video in the description box. And now back to the show. Into the space, and it has window stops on either side, and it's completely infiltration proof. Looking at the heat budget of a house during the day, you gain heat from the sun. No wood stove is needed on a sunny January zero degree day, but at night you lose heat rapidly through the glass. Our double pane windows have a resistance to heat loss of two, while our walls have a resistance of 32. And so you must change the nature of the windows. You must increase their resistance. We have been using polystyrene shutters or an aluminized material called Astralon, which reflects 98% of the heat back into the room. And these are mounted as shades, which increase the insulative value of the windows, equivalent to five panes of glass during the night. And during the day, we open them to receive the sun. It's the weirdest thing, whereas normally you're sitting next to a window at night and it feels cold, the, with the shades drawn, it reflects your radiant heat back against your body and you feel very warm. If you really wanted to develop the idea of the passive solar house to the logical extreme, what you do is give the house a thermal mass or an ability to absorb heat without raising its temperature. The heat mass might be water or concrete, which would store heat during a period of heat gain, say during a sunny day. Then by drawing the astralon curtain at night, we'd prevent heat loss through the windows. The heat mass would then slowly give its heat back during the night, and there might be periods when we wouldn't need to use the wood stove for a day and a night. The active solar house bothers me only in the sense that it might be overkill. It's questionable to go from total disregard of sunlight to building a solar energy machine when by simply orienting the house towards the sun, building overhangs of the right angle, and putting in windows which are matched to the thermal mass, it's possible to cut the fuel consumption by 50% or more without any machinery. I'm not totally against it. I'm very much for it in areas of the country where it's the appropriate technology. In Maine, where we have a high number of degree days, say 8,000 degree days, where the percentage of sunshine hours is fairly low, and where we're surrounded by wood, which is just molding into the ground around us, the obvious solution is wood heat and the passive solar house. In the active solar house, the figures we're hearing now for hardware is around $8,000. In houses we're talking about up here, there isn't $8,000 in all of the material in the entire house. We want the house to take care of itself. We want the house to be passive. We don't want to get into a vicious loop with a technological machine. So we want the house to be heated very simply by a radiating object, a wood stove. The wood stove heats in two ways. The closer you get to a stove, the more radiation you receive and the hotter you feel. That's one way it transfers heat to the building. The other way is through convection. It actually physically heats the air. What physically happens is the hot air rises above the stove, which is on the rear north wall, and it falls along the cold southern windows at night. On one side it's falling, and on the other side it's rising, so naturally you get a circular motion of the air, and it turns over very rapidly if the stove is placed properly. I wouldn't trade it for anything. We used our wood stove for heat as well as for cooking. Um, so when I had it on all the time, it made sense to be baking bread or to be cooking some stew. And I do bake all our bread, and I would have felt very guilty if I'd turned on an electric range as well as my wood stove, which was on already. It's sad to say, though, wood is not a cure-all to our energy problems. There's been a massive turning to wood heat, exemplifying a general misunderstanding of geometric growth. In a short period, large numbers of people have turned from using no wood heat, no wood, to using wood for heat almost exclusively. The pinch is already felt. Wood is expensive and hard to get. In Norway, it costs $200 a cord. In the Midwest, it's virtually impossible to get. In Maine, it went from $20 to $60 a cord in two years. The right idea is to use wood only when the owner can replenish his supply indefinitely. We grow all our own wood in the form of fast-growing firebush, on a half acre of land which is unsuitable for anything else. Our children cut all our firewood. 
two boys, one five, one seven. They cut 10 alders per day. An alder is a tree which is maybe 20 feet tall, anywhere from two to six inches in diameter. And it grows to harvestable lengths in three, four years. Uh, there are wood stoves now which are remarkably efficient, more efficient than oil burning stoves. 90% of the wood put into a Norwegian stove uh, is converted into heat, whereas only 65 or so percent of oil is converted into heat. There's enough wood between the net growth, the net waste in industry, and the net death per year to heat 73 million passive solar heated homes, which is as many homes as there are in, in America. We end up, by using wood, with complete independence. We're de-plugged from a system that has become so complex that it can't be dependable anymore. It just takes a little bit of learning, of relearning, of doing what really is uh, quite natural for humans, to take care of their own problems instead of relying on something out there to take care of it for them. In terms of material, wood is the perfect material to build with. Believe it or not, wood is as strong as iron. It's just that iron is about 10 times heavier than wood. Wood is an extremely strong material. Typically, the tensile strength of wood is 2,000 pounds per square inch. That's what you're allowed to use as a tensile strength. And actual tests of pure specimens get up to 8,000 pounds per square inch. That's equivalent in iron to 80,000 pounds per square inch. And that's a pretty good grade of iron. In terms of fire safety, fire insurance underwriters consider wood uh, heavy timber frame structures safer than steel frame structures. If you frame with heavy timbers over four inch minimum dimension, it'll take several hours for that building to collapse. But with a steel building, if you achieve a high enough temperature, it would just take a few minutes for one of the steel beams to collapse because it'll melt. And so since wood is naturally available, it's capable of having nails driven quickly into it, and it's easily fashioned by saws and chisels, and it smells good, and it looks nice, and it's capable of um, lasting as long as any material. It's actually the perfect building material. Our greatest influence has been to foster the local economy. All of the materials that are used in these houses are local materials, milled and lumbered right here. We found in Maine that the use of locally cut rough sawn lumber is uh, unmatchable. There's absolutely no reason to buy planed lumber in the actual framing of a house. I don't know where planing originated. Planing greatly reduces the strength of lumber. For instance, a 2x4 planed uh, is much weaker than a 2x4 unplaned. So our students uh, figure the stresses and strains, the mechanics of the house in terms of unplaned lumber, and they end up using much less lumber, and it costs a, gr a good deal less because it's uh, rough sawn and yet it's much stronger than the plain material, so they end up with a much better product. What has always struck me the most about building a house is how cheap it is compared to what it costs to buy one. You can build your own house for from five to ten dollars a square foot, whereas a contractor built home costs around thirty dollars per square foot. And it's because you have the choice of what materials go into the house, and because you understand how to integrate those materials. Most of the students are building without loans. The, the great thing about building your own home is that usually you can build it for what a bank requires as a down payment. There's a great, great lack of manufactured goods in our houses. Most of the students build their own double windows. They build their own doors. You won't find an aluminum storm screen hanging outside of any of the doors. And it's cheaper, and it also gives you a better insulation factor. A lot of people somehow feel that new is best and they completely overlook an older, sometimes much better way of doing things. We don't have to use plastic because it's newer than wood. We use whatever is appropriate. We use the tools, we use the material that's appropriate. If you have a lot of straight pine trees and you have a broad axe, then you can hew out a beam rather than wait six weeks for it from the lumber mill. It's true, associated with, with the type of thing we're doing is the idea of back to the homestead and back to the simple, old-fashioned ways. Uh, that's not what we are, are into. We're into finding the best, most efficient way to deal with each problem. And that changes both in terms of time and in terms of place. A basement is most often a ludicrous thing to buy today. People are convinced that they need one, and once they have one, think only in terms of changing it into something else. The real primary function of the foundation is to hold the house up. This is the foundation upon which the house is built. As far as performance goes, there are several types of foundations, often better than the full basement. 
A full concrete basement foundation is essentially a well which you've dug and then you spend the rest of your life trying to keep water out of it. On most sites left today, a basement is inappropriate because the water table is too high. However, if the water table is 10 feet down, building the entire house underground could be the most energy efficient solution. Paint is just a cover up. It's like cosmetics on a face. It's just hiding what's behind it. Paint does nothing for wood. The important thing in keeping wood from rotting is to not allow wood to stay wet for any period of time. Wood can get wet and then dry innumerable times with no damage at all to the wood. So you design your house in such a way that wood does not stay wet. Wood without paint will deteriorate at a quarter inch per hundred years, so it's absurd to put paint on wood. We turn to paint for color in our lives, and we can add that with planting. Roses, forsythia, petunias, lilacs, and they add much more color. Paint's an infatuation costing energy and money and locks us into a maintenance cycle. Once you start painting, you have to keep on painting. What a waste to create an object that demands constant attention and which will need repainting every five years. There's no piece, no building material more poorly designed for building than a brick. What could be more ludicrous than to pile up a million of these and call it a house? It has, there's nothing weaker than a brick wall, although we've been taught to think that brick is very strong. But uh, you know, the slightest knock against the brick wall will shatter it. There's no insulative value in a brick wall. The whole thing is, is a facade. It originated with English sea captains who brought brick over as ballast, and it became a status symbol to have a brick house. Take a post-industrial view of your life. Use what is rational, what is good, what has been produced by our society, but don't be so dependent on it that you can't discard what is not good from that society, what is wasteful and what is not meaningful. So it's really trying to teach people to stand back and take an overview. Shelter is a very basic need, and so then perhaps you take a good look at that basic self. They really want to make it. By building your own place, you're making every decision along the way. You're kind of reflecting yourself against what you're making. We've seen people from all different fields and all different ages, all different backgrounds. These people are all disturbed with what is happening today. They'd like to take their lives into their hands again. They'd like to have more control over their life. So they do have something in common. We've learned so much from our students. It's been fantastic. Just to see how strong we are. OK, everybody ready on three? No. One, two, three, heave! Very nice. One, two, three, heave! Okay, down slowly. You guys are much stronger than I thought. Everybody ready?